Great morning, Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd ask you to stand. In the book of Revelation, we have a description of the throne room of God. And there's creatures that says they do not rest day or night, and that they repeat this holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, would we join him as we sing this great hymn of our faith. that verse again. 
It's the gospel. There's hope through the blood of Jesus Christ. sang a couple weeks ago. It's the hope to every problem that you could ever have. Who has the power to raise the dead? Who can save us from our sin? He is our bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just ask that our praise might be pleasing to you. Father, you're the only one that uh, deserves our praise. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection. That, Father, we can uh, stand here today and sing loud your praise because only because of Jesus, only because of your love. So, Father, as we continue to worship, may our praise be pleasing to you. As we listen to a message, may the message uh, go down deep into our minds, into our heart, that we might walk out of here, change from the inside, that others might see Jesus on the outside. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. If you're a guest here at Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church, we'd like to say welcome and thank you for being here. If you'd take a moment right in the pew in front of you, in the little card rack is one of these Connect cards. If you'd take a moment, we also provide a pen for that. How's that? How neat is that? You just uh, fill out the information requested at the end of the service. Just drop it in the offering plate. We'll have uh, we'll actually contact you uh, with a card or email or something like that. Nothing, you know, we won't go pound on your door or anything like that, but uh, please give us some information. We'd like to get to know you a little bit better. If uh, you're here and uh, you're, if you're, are you happy to be here? Let's just, you know. uh, I'm excited to be here. It's a great day because uh, there's something's happening at the end. We won't tell you if you've, you know, but you know, there's something happening going on at the end. Okay. Lunch. No, we could go without lunch. Okay. All right. Wow, how'd I get on that, Mark? I'm sorry. Okay, but uh, so let's spend some time uh, getting to know each other. So, uh, shake hands. We have a time of welcome right now. So let's all stand and shake hands. Well, church family, if you'll find your seats, as Bill already so eloquently put it, today is a great day for our church. At the end of our service, we'll have a chance uh, to vote, as long as you're a member uh, and you're in ninth grade or older, uh, you'll have the chance to vote yes on calling Chris Curtis as our worship pastor. Now, just be patient. You will receive some instruction on how to do it. The ballots are already in your pew. We're not asking you to fill them out now. Please do not fill them out now, unless you're marking yes. <laughs> then you can fill them out at any point you want. So we are honored and privileged to invite Chris Curtis to lead us in worship today. As we said a couple weeks ago, uh, as our worship pastor search committee started meeting uh, in January, there is 10 of us which is quite a few people when it comes to interview time to not, be, to not be intimidating. Ten of us gathered for many, many hours, spent many hours in prayer, several weeks meeting together. And as we were meeting and praying and reviewing candidates, uh, we came to a point uh, just uh, about six or seven weeks ago in which we realized the candidate that God wants for our church was already leading worship for us. And so as we we're convinced of it by the Holy Spirit, praying fervently to the Lord. We asked Chris if he would be a candidate. We were able to interview him, check with his references, do his background check, and thank the Lord he passed all those things. And so he will be here today in view of a call. So we're very excited for him. And as I said, at the end of the sermon, after the offertory, there will be some instructions given to how we vote, okay? All right. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to invite Chris. Chris has been encouraged to give us a brief testimony today. So, if Chris, if you'll come up and just share what God has done in your life. I mean, thanks, Pastor. Appreciate it. Um, Romans 8.28 is a familiar passage. 
to most um, of us that are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I just happen to have seen it lived out in my life. It says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. I was called at a young age to salvation, but I ran as far as I possibly could from God. I tried to fill my life with lots of different things, from alcohol to sex to money, and none of those things could satisfy my soul. And it was a desperate situation later in my life that I don't mind sharing the details of. Again, shared many of them yesterday with the meet and greet. But I don't boast about that past life. As the Apostle Paul said, he doesn't boast in any of those things. He boasts in the cross of Jesus Christ. So in 2003, at the Heights Baptist Church, and the preaching of Dr. James Miller, I was saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. I thought my whole life that I could never be good enough for God. When I was a kid, I went to church every morning, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday evening. I ran because I never thought I could be good enough for God. What I ultimately came to find out was that I'd been right all along. I will never be good enough for God. But it's not about what Chris Curtis has done. It's about what Jesus Christ did for me, and he continues to do. The book of Hebrews says he even intercedes for us now, again. So he saved me in 2003, and I haven't gotten over it yet. Under James Miller's preaching, again, I was particular about where I would be serving next because I believe in a pastor who preaches the word of God, doesn't throw us softballs, but he comes up, and I listen to many of Mark's sermons before talking with Bryce about coming to Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church and ultimately the search team. But I was called into that ministry and I was a interim music there for about two years before God moved us to Maryland uh, via the Air Force where my last duty station was. He opened up opportunities for me to serve as an interim music minister at two different churches there. In fact, I think it's very funny that the pastor that I served with at Glen Burnie Baptist Church in Maryland, uh, he's preaching this morning in view of a call in North Carolina. We chatted last night. I'm here in view of a call today, humbled by the opportunity to serve because I've been, uh, served out in East Texas after that time in Maryland for a couple years as a music minister, but I've been a teaching pastor for the past five years in a little town out in West Texas. But Lori and I, back in June, sensed that God was calling us more into an associate pastor role, and this is a great fit for us uh, because, again, we know that God's called us here. It's a, a group of people that, uh, again, we want to serve with, and again, I'm just humbled. The, the one thing that I shared with Mark and I shared with the team, I, I feel so very little amongst such great instrumentalists and such a great choir like this, but I'm privilege to come and be a part of this family and again uh, I pray that we will worship the Lord each and every day not just on Sundays as I've become the worship pastor here let's stand as we continue to worship that verse again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name.
coming back one day. Amen. Amen. Let's sing it. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand. book of Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah proclaims amongst destruction and decay of Jerusalem, he makes this proclamation, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow. So a good, good father. You ever think of him that way? You were just think of his dad. My little girl, when I'd come home from Colorado, she would come running to me, say, Daddy, I missed you. Do you think of God in that fashion, that he's a good, good father? I pray that as we sing this new song that Charles sang last week, that we would sing it with that intent, that he is a good, good father. Please and 
you loved us first. So Father, I pray now that as we listen to your word proclaim that we would go away from here changed for your glory and your long. Fill your pastor with your Holy Spirit, God. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, church family, I appreciate you being here with us today, even with an 11 o'clock kickoff. We will try to make everything... Uh, you know, as, as uh, condensed as possible. Last week, uh, I announced that uh, in November of next year that I'll be leading a trip to uh, Israel. There's going to be an information meeting next Sunday, October 1st, immediately after church in just that room right over there. I believe it's room 212, but don't quote me. The reason we're going is because we have lost a little bit of the tradition uh, within the Protestant faith or Protestant denominations. Uh, we've lost the tradition of the pilgrimage. So this trip next year, we will be going to Israel. We will see where Jesus stood. We will stand where Jesus stood. We will pray where Jesus prayed. We'll walk where Jesus walked. And the stories of the Bible will come alive for us. We are going with Dr. Calvin Whitman and Applewood Baptist Church. So if you're interested in that trip, there's some information just at the Connect desk as you leave today. And then come next Sunday morning to the information meeting. If you're not able to make that meeting, that's not a problem. You just let me know, and I'll get you all the information you need. Now also, if you're looking for a way uh, to serve others, as you know, we're doing an emphasis right now called Rock the City, Random Acts of Kindness, in which... The idea is that we grow and become more like Jesus Christ as we serve others. So next, Sunday mor next Saturday morning, uh, we're going to do something called Walk the Walk. It's going to be Saturday at 8 a.m. We're going to meet in the foyer here of the worship center. We're going to go door-to-door -door distributing Bibles. So let me encourage you to bring a backpack or some other bag, because you're going to have 40 Bibles. You're going to be teamed up, sent out, given addresses, and we'll saturate our neighborhood with God's Word. Now, one reason we will distribute Bibles through Walk the Walk is because we are committed to God's Word, which is why today we're going to continue in our sermon series on the Lord's Prayer, where we are just walking step by step through Jesus' teaching on prayer. Now, this week, again, we're utilizing the YouVersion Bible app, so if you use on your smartphone or on your tablet, you use the Bible app, you can open the app, click on More, there you will find an, a, a, a part that says events, where you should find our church service at the top of the list. So you click on that, and you'll have our service. Do that, and you'll be able to find today's passage on your mobile device. But for those of us in the room who have our Bibles in our hand rather than at our fingertips, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter nine, 6. We're going to start in verse 9. One reason, one another reason we're walking through the Lord's Prayer step by step is simply because each sentence of this prayer is packed with meaning. Powerful, influential words from Jesus Christ. 
And today is no difference. It is one sentence. Matthew 6, 9 is one sentence. And this one sentence is packed with meaning. Now, I love sentences that are packed with meaning. For example, I love the phrase, and I know my parents do too, the phrase that is, because I said so. We also like the phrase, I told you so. Right? Now, we can find these types of sentences everywhere in a hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Finish it with me. That saved a wretch like me. We find them from politicians. Powerful sentences. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. If only we would rediscover that idea. Charles Dickens wrote, he started off his book, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And movies have their fair share, but mine, this one from Jaws, is my favorite you're going to need a bigger boat, right? Now, Yogi Berra of the New York Yankees was famous for his sentences, his quips. You may remember the one that says, when you come to a fork in the road, take it, right? Or it's like deja vu all over again. Wait a minute. Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer with a simple but profound sentence. Why don't you read Matthew 6, 9? And we're going to go all the way through the prayer. 6, 9 through 13. But pay close attention to that very first sentence that we read. It says, Matthew 6, 9, Jesus said, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Father, we just want to praise you that you sent your Son to this earth, he died for our sins. He rose from the grave that we might have life. But in those years before that, He provides such profound teachings on everything that we need for life, including these teachings on prayer. We confess, Father, there's times when we pray and we don't pray as we should. And we need Your help. So, Father, speak to us through the words that You gave through Your Son. Speak to us today on prayer that we might be a people devoted to prayer and to praying rightly. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now before Jesus gives us what we now know as the Lord's Prayer, He provides two examples of how not to pray, and He gives us two examples of how to pray. In verses 5 and 6, which we were in two weeks ago, he tells us that there is no heavenly value in praying so that you can gain other people's attention. You can gain other people's esteem. Instead, he tells us we should pray as though nobody else but God is listening. And even find a private space for the majority of our prayer time. That was his teaching two weeks ago. And the next pair of verses, in verses 7 and 8, Jesus warns against a different misunderstanding of prayer. He tells us that we do not have to follow certain rituals in order to gain God's attention to our prayers. Some believed that you had to repeat certain phrases over and over and over again so that God would listen to you. Others believed that you had to pray for long hours or with great passion and fervency in order to gain God's attention, to deserve God's response. Now, to be clear, there is a value in praying for many hours, and there's a value in praying with great ferocity. But we do not have to pray in such a way as to earn God's response or God's answer. Jesus encourages us to remember that when we approach God in prayer, 
we're approaching our Father who knows exactly what we need before we even have to ask Him. So this week, we're finally to the Lord's Prayer itself. But let's keep something in mind, because it's a little bit ironic. Let's keep in mind Jesus' words from last week. That Jesus says, don't repeat, mindlessly repeat words and words all over again. Because there are people who just mindlessly repeat the Lord's Prayer. Right? That's the irony here. Is that people just read Jesus' words in verses 7 and 8, where he says, don't mindlessly pray. And then he says, pray then like uh, this. He gives us the Lord's Prayer, and what do people do? Mindlessly pray the Lord's Prayer over and over again. It's highly ironic that this prayer has come to be repeated mechanically in many Christian traditions, accompanied by the notion that the frequency of repetition develops us spiritually. We may choose to pray these exact words, but when we do so, we should do so thoughtfully and reflectively. Or, we should take the words written here and put our own words with similar concerns. There is a value in repeating this prayer, but it's a means to teach us the proper way to pray. There is no value in repeating this prayer over and over again, if the goal is to earn God's favor. So what Jesus gives us here is a model, a model prayer that may be employed in fashioning all of our other prayers. That's the value of the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to use the Lord's Prayer as a model. So the first thing that we must keep in mind when we craft our own prayers is that, when we, is that we get to pray to God We get to pray to God as our fathers. In other words, we get to access God's familiarity. We get to access God's familiarity. Jesus begins his prayer with a radically new way for us to understand our relationship with God. When Jesus calls God Father. In calling God Father, he uses a term of endearment, which is closer to the words dad or daddy, than the formality that we have with the word Father, right? Jesus is teaching us that we should consider God as accessible as the most loving human parent. That He's right there. We have access to God just as we would to our own dad. So when we pray, we have access to God as family. He is to be as familiar to us as our own family. He's not someone else's dad. He's our dad, and he's always ready to answer our requests. Now, growing up, I had a friend. He was really a friend of my older sister's, and he had a dad named John. And this dad we affectionately called Uncle John. Now, it seemed to me, even though I'm certain that it wasn't true, that when this friend approached his dad for money, that his dad gave him money each and every single time just seemed that way. I'm sure I didn't see what was going on behind the scenes. Maybe he partioned it out as an allowance. Maybe there was manual labor involved. I don't know. But it really seemed like this friend, each and every time he'd go to his dad, his dad would always give him money. Now, when I approached John, whom I affectionately called Uncle John, and when I asked him for money... He never once gave me any money, right? Our friend could go to his dad and say, Dad, can I have 20 bucks? Which back then was a lot of money, right? That was a whole night. But when I approached Uncle John and I asked him for 20 bucks, he said, no, right? Go away. I knew him as a godly man. I knew him as a servant of our church. And I called him Uncle John, but I didn't know him as Dad. Jesus teaches that we get to approach God as Dad. And our Dad knows exactly what we need. Now Jesus turns from this familiarity of praying to our Dad to a reminder of God's greatness. When we pray, we pray to God 
who resides in heaven. So the second part of this powerful sentence that starts off this model prayer is a reminder to praise God's greatness. The phrase, in heaven, balances familiarity with an affirmation of God's sovereign majesty. While we get to pray to someone who is as familiar to us as a dad, we can never forget that we are praying to the sovereign God who reigns over the entire universe. So this is a delicate balance. God is our dad, but he is all-powerful. God is our father, but he is all-knowing. We get to call him pops, but we have to remember his ways are not our ways. So what does it mean to balance our prayers to be able to approach God as dad, but also as sovereign and majestic. Does he give us all that we ask for? Or because he is God and he's set apart, does he ignore all of our requests? 1 John 5. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 helps us out. It says, and this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. And so we ask, we ask our sovereign dad, we ask, He hears, we have according to His will. Okay? So when we approach God, we approach Dad, who is sovereign over all the universe and capable, fully capable, of doing anything and everything that He wants. So we approach Dad, we ask, He hears, we have according to His will. Now there's a danger here of being repetitive, of talking about God as Father. Because we've done this the last two weeks. But here's the deal. Jesus speaks of God as Father in verse 6, in verse 8, and again in verse 9. So if Jesus is being repetitive, I get to be repetitive as well. So as we pray, let's access God with great familiarity because we're approaching our Dad, our Father. Second, Let's remember that we're praying to the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present creator and sustainer of the universe. So let's never hesitate to ask. We never hesitate to ask. And then we're patient. Because He will answer according to His will. We do not know, nor can we always understand His plans and His purposes. We have to love our Heavenly Father when He both listens and answers our prayers according to our requests, and we must love our Heavenly Father when He hears our prayers but does not answer them according to what we ask for. And so we love Him when He heals, and we love Him when He doesn't according to His will. We love Him when He provides, and we love Him when He doesn't. We love Him when He rescues. And we love Him when He doesn't. The first is easy. It's easy to love God when He heals. It's easy to love God when He provides. It's easy to love Him when He rescues. I mean, I know. I've been there, kids. I haven't studied for the test. And seconds before taking it, I've said, God, give me the answers. Right? What I should be praying is, God, make the test according to what I know. Right? I've prayed that prayer, and sometimes my prayer has come true. I knew the answers. And sometimes my prayer was denied. And I had no idea what was on the test. So we pray, and we love Him when He heals. We pray, and we love Him when He provides We pray and we love Him when He rescues us even from our own lack of preparation. And that is easy. But we're also, we love Him when He doesn't heal our loved ones. We love Him when He doesn't provide what we want. 
We love him when he doesn't rescue us. That's faithfulness. This is what it means to approach God both as father, as dad, and to approach him as Lord who reigns in heaven. So after teaching us to balance our prayers to a familiar yet majestic God, Jesus then tells us to pray. He tells us something really, it's honestly a little bizarre. Hallowed be your name. Now what Jesus meant by name refers to someone's person, their character, their authority. It's all that God stands for is His name, His sovereignty, His holiness, His righteousness. Everything is found in God's name. And hallowed means to make holy. So we're asking God to make His name holy. Which is a little bizarre. This would be like us going to Paula Deen and saying, Paula Deen, we need you to add some more sugar to your recipes. Right? There is absolutely no need. This would be going to Anthony Bourdain and saying, Anthony, I need you to be a little bit more sarcastic. Right? Just be a little bit more sarcastic. This would be like, if we were to tell God to be more holy, it would be like going on Bizarre Foods and telling Andrew Zimmern to eat some weird stuff. He already does it. It'd be like telling Gordon Ramsay to be more British or tell Rachel Ray to use more olive oil. There's just, there seems to be no need for it, right? So when we pray, God, hallowed be your name, we're praying to God and asking Him to make His name holy. But it is already holy as it can be. God's name, His character, His righteousness is already as holy as it can be. So there is depth behind this mystery. Jesus isn't telling us to ask God to be more holy. Instead, Jesus tells us to ask God to reveal His holiness. When we pray, we ask God to reveal His holiness. And what Jesus is doing here is He is giving us a gospel-saturated prayer request. Before we ask God, notice, we've not yet asked God anything, any one thing for ourselves, right? How often do we start our prayer with, God, please give this to me. Please help me. Please provide for me. Please heal this person. How often are we at the center of our prayers? But before we ask God for one thing for ourselves, we ask God to reveal Himself to those who have no relationship with Him through Christ. This is a missions prayer. God, make Your name holy. Reveal Your holiness. John Piper put it this way. He said, The first and all-pervasive, all-influencing, all-controlling concern in prayer is to plead with God that God would make His name supremely valuable in the hearts and minds of people. God, make your name the most valuable thing in our lives and in the lives of those who don't know you. Martin Lloyd-Jones said to pray, Hallowed be your name means a burning desire that the entire world may bow down before God in adoration, in reverence, in praise, in worship, in honor, and in thanksgiving. Is that our desire? Church, is that our desire? We pray to a familiar God. We praise God. And then we are to pray that God would reveal His name, His character, His sovereignty, His worth to those who are outside the body of Christ. Do you pray that way? Do I? Do you pray for the lost? Do you pray for the Holy Spirit to move in such a radical way that the lost will be found? That they will be saved? That the lonely will discover the family of God? That the selfish will discover a selfless Savior? That the hollow will find fulfillment in following Christ? That the aimless will find purpose in the mission of God? That the hopelessness, that those who are hopeless, We'll find hope 
in the cross. That every knee will bow and every tongue proclaim Jesus as Lord of all. Do you pray in that way? Do you pray, God, make your name known? Let's pray that prayer. Church, this is the model prayer. This is Jesus saying, this is how you are to pray. And so our prayers this moment, our prayers this day, our prayers this week, our prayers this month, our prayer this year, and our prayer this life, let us pray this way. Let's obey Jesus' teachings and pray that God will make His name known. So we start with prayers. Pleading, God, reveal Your name. Reveal who You are to all who have yet to believe. Let's pray this way. In fact, let's pray that way right now. Church, let's pray. Father, we praise You. We thank You that we get to approach You. And Father, we ask for those in this room who do not have that right because they do not have that relationship with You, make Your name known to them. Just as you made it known to Chris, just as you made it known to Gloria, make your name known. Father, we need you. Spirit, we need you to move today. And those who do not know you, Lord, we ask for you to move. And for those of us who know you, Lord, help us. Because we must confess, we do not know how to pray as we ought to. So this week, remind us of how to pray. It's in your name. Amen. Now, earlier, you heard from Chris. You heard his story. That there is no one, no matter what you've done, no, one, no matter where you've been, no matter how young you are or how old you are, there is no one that God doesn't love. That God does not want to have a relationship with. And I'm here to tell you, if you do not have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, one that you made a knowing and willing decision for, I am going to commit my life to the Lord. If you've never done that, you don't get to call God Father. You are cut off and separated from Him, but He makes a promise. The very moment that you decide to follow Him, that you decide to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that moment you get to call God Dad. So the pastors will be down front. Bill, Bryce, and I will be down front. And we would love to visit with you. If you sit in there saying, you know what? I'm not, I, I don't, this is all weird to me, or I'm not familiar with this, or I thought I did stuff and God couldn't love me. If that's you, Bill, Bryce, and I would love to visit with you and share with you how you can have that same relationship with God that you can call Him Dad. If you are in need of prayer, we would love to pray with you, and these steps are open to those who are in need of prayer. Or if you'd like to join this wonderful church, now would be the time to move. As Chris leads us in song, I'm going to ask for you to stand. And if God is working in your heart, we will be down front, ready to visit with you. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son to make a wretch his dread. How great the pain of searing walls, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which bar the chosen one, bring many sons to Yeah.
I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me Can't boast in anything except Jesus Christ. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, nor wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. As the ushers come down, please join me in prayer. Father, Dad, just want you to really bless this entire congregation. The, uh, as we come forward with our gifts, the, uh, whether it be money, our service, our time, the big part is just help us to make your name known in this nation, in this, in this world, in this silly town called Aurora. In Jesus' name. Well, on behalf of Pastor Mark and the Worship Pastor Search Team, I'm going to call us into a time of voting. I'm going to ask if uh, Brother Chris and Miss Gloria, if you guys would exit, Miss Mandy, uh, if you would just kind of escort them out. (laughs) You do need to cast a ballot first, yes. (laughs) Well, yes, Mandy does, not Chris and Gloria. Make sure you understand that. All right. Well, we are here this morning to affirm the call of Chris Curtis 
to serve as our uh, next worship pastor here at Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church. If you do me a favor, those of you who are sitting on the left side of the pews, there should be a stack of green cards that look like this. If you would please take those and pass those down. Um, if you are, we've had a little bit of confusion, the ballots say eighth grade, so eighth graders, congratulations, you get to vote this morning. Um, so eighth grade and up, if you are a member of the church, okay, there's two qualifications, well three, um, four. You're here, you're alive, you're a church member, and you're eighth grade or older, okay? If you need more ballots, please raise your hand. We have ushers who will bring some to you. Anybody else need a ballot? Got a row there. Okay. Anybody else? Last call? All right. It's a very simple process. You're going to see a motion to call Chris Curtis as worship pastor. A vote yes means that you affirm his call uh, to come and to uh, serve as our next worship pastor. So if you would like for that to happen, please check the yes box. If you are volunteering to serve on the worship pastor search team and start the process over again, you can check no. And please mark your name, and we'll make sure that you get to be involved in those endless meetings, okay? All right? Pastor Mark said he's not. He's, he's out, so, all right? And then you need to check your box that you are a member. Please affirm that you are a member of Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church, okay? So when you've done that, those who are sitting on the, the left side, if you would pass all those ballots down to the right, we've got the ushers, if y'all want to come on forward. Bill, collect all those beside you and uh, turn them in. Yeah, there you go. Good job. So please pass them to the right. The ushers will pick them up on the right side of your pew, okay? My left, your right. So you can fold them over, uh, turn those in. I should have also said we're not Chicago. Vote once only, please. I think that's assumed, but I'm not sure. You never know. If you're voting yes, you can vote multiple times. We'll, we'll overlook that. Just joking. Just joking, kind of. So pass them to the right. Have all ballots been collected? Are there any ballots that still need to be collected? The ushers will be taking those to the deacons, the deacon body. And we'll be counting those. I think we still need some collected over there. Any more ballots? All right, very good. And I get to entertain you for a few minutes, right? So while they count, we'll do announcements. And then for your viewing pleasure and participation this morning, if I run out of material, I've got Bill Ingram on standby to lead us in song. So they may want to hear that more than the announcements. So we may go there first, right? All right, so here's just some of the upcoming events in the life of our church. Uh, before I do this, so I don't forget, uh, if you are uncomfortable walking an aisle and you would like to talk with one of the pastors, we'll be at the prayer room uh, when the service is over, and we would love to meet with you there. Also, a reminder, today is the last day uh, to submit deacon nominations. If you have an individual that you would like to submit a deacon nomination for, uh, please uh, fill out one of the cards at the Connect desk. Then once you've filled that out completely, uh, then please turn it into the slot right there, um, just behind the Connect desk, the secure slot. And those uh, nominations are being collected, and today uh, is the last day for that. Also, we have a leadership meeting tonight at 4 o'clock. Uh, so we will be all those who are in leadership. Um, you should have received an email. If you didn't receive an email but you're in leadership, please come. Some of you don't have email, right? So you don't get my emails. But, uh, but please come tonight at 4 o'clock in the worship center. We will start here. And then we'll break out to our age-based um, groups. We'll have kids uh, and preschool together, we'll have uh, students together, student ministry together, we'll have adults together uh, towards the second half of that meeting. 
Uh, Pastor Bill is also very excited, and I'm sure if he comes to sing, you're going to hear about this more before he sings. But the pumpkin patch is officially open for business. And uh, so we, uh, we unloaded uh, 1,010 pumpkins, I believe was the number, uh, the other day. And so they are right outside. Uh, and so we will now be open, I think, through October 31st, correct? And so the sign and then the bulletin, you've got some information there um, on the times of that. Also want to remind those of you with the triple L uh, who have signed up and bought a ticket for South Pacific this week. Um, I was informed by uh, Mr. Parker this morning that the bus will leave at 1 o'clock, okay? So uh, you need to be here probably about 15 minutes before, okay? So the buses are leaving at 1 o'clock, uh, so please be here by 1245, 10 till, something like that. The buses will be leaving right on time. I was also uh, informed that the, the Secret Sisters group, it's so secretive that I don't know anything about it, uh, is starting up again. Uh, this Friday night, if you've got questions, uh, see Kathy Peters or sign up at the Connect Desk. I believe this is for uh, a group of ladies who get together and support and love each other secretly. Um, but I'm a guy, so I can't go. So um, Kathy has all the information. Uh, but this Friday night at 6.15 to 7.30, uh, they'll have a meeting in the gym. There's some information at the Connect Desk. Uh, so please be aware of that. Also, I just want to send out a big thank you to many of you uh, who participated, who supported, who worked uh, our car show yesterday. Uh, we had a great turnout. Uh, we had over 85 cars come uh, and motorcycles, and that's with impending rain and temperatures that never got above about 55, I think, out there. Uh, but I want to thank Charlie Bardish and Linda Bardish for really doing a fantastic job, Andy Mortensen, Charlie Brown, uh, the whole kitchen crew that cooked breakfast. It was a great event. We had vendors. It was a family event. We hope to just grow that event every year. So next year, uh, make sure you're aware of that. We had some amazing cars show up. We had a 1927 Model T racing car show up, uh, which was really cool to see. Uh, the windshield was uh, a single glass circle in front of the driver's face, and that was it. Uh, it was kind of how they did it back then. So you never know what you're going to see at our car show. So make sure you come next year and uh, be a part of that. But we are very thankful uh, for that and thankful for all of you that served. Bill, I think I'm kind of tired of talking. I think they want to hear you sing, right? All right, everybody, let's let Pastor Bill lead us in song here, okay? All right. In the pew. Way to go, Bryce. That was awesome announcement. Yeah. In the pew in front of you is called, called a hymn book. And if you turn to 447, we also have the words up there. It says, trust and obey. Let's just sing that. Yeah, you can stand. <laughs> when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Let us do his good will, lay and abide with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Sing it. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Verse 2. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toils he doth richly repay. Not, not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a loss, but all do we trust and obey. Do you mean this? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and... We're going to do verse 3. But we'll never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay for the favor he 
shows and the joy he bestows are to the Lamb who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. There's a verse 4. Then in fellowship sweet we shall sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way where he sends we will go where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey sing it loud trust and obey was singing, I reached into my pocket. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was good. Hey, that is good. Uh, I mean, I think I remember singing this song when I was about seven years old um, around the campfire. My parents would take me out there and we'd sing songs and just keep singing songs. And so a lot of the words I know, some of them I forget. So anyway, but uh, I reached in my pocket and uh, I pulled out this little piece of material right here. This is what we use for the pumpkin patch. And so uh, this is a shameless plug for the pumpkin patch that uh, yesterday, and Bryce didn't have these numbers, but uh, yesterday we sold $750 worth of pumpkins. We spent, yeah, praise the Lord. Hey, we can do uh, 448, just a closer walk with thee. That's right there. Uh, but you'll have to look in your hymn book because she's not ready for that. But uh, anyway, it was neat at the pumpkin patch. Of that $750, $220 was tip. It's not because I'm good looking. <laughs> Amen. It's not because I'm a sweet talker. God lays it on people's hearts to uh, do the right thing. $220 tip. That's a big tip. So let's do this. Just a closer walk with thee. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all harm. Stop it. <laughs> it's with a 97% approval rating. I haven't finished my sentence yet. I can, I can keep this going. That we're excited to announce that Chris Curtis will join us as our worship pastor. I guess it's much like the prophet Isaiah encountering the Lord. He says, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I'm not deserving, but I'm grateful by God's grace to become part of this fellowship here. So all glory to him. Hey, Mandy, we're done with meeting. Praise the Lord. Chris is going to lead us out in song. Have a great week.